following Ruth Davidson's questions. We move now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today I welcome the publication of the Scottish Government's paper on tax. We will take time to study it in detail and are happy to engage on it as the First Minister has requested. But let me raise some initial questions. In it, the First Minister claims that the health of the economy will be front and centre of any tax changes that she makes. Can I ask her, will she grant the request that's been made by economists and trade bodies to conduct a full, independent and thorough economic assessment of any tax changes before they're undertaken? First Minister. Well, we will, we will consider any uh, reasonable request that is made in the context of the discussions uh, that we will have following the publication of today's paper. But of course, it is uh, incumbent on the Finance Secretary, the Government generally, to put forward proposals that we consider to be in the best interest of the country as a whole. Uh, in my view, the most important aspect of the paper we have published today uh, are the four key tests that should guide our uh, decision making. Uh, we need to make sure that we protect the ability of this parliament to fund our public services. We need to protect those on the lowest uh, incomes. We need to make the tax system fair and tackle inequality. Uh, and of course, we need to make sure that the interests of our economy are absolutely at the heart of all the decisions uh, we take. One of the things I, I said this morning, and I, I genuinely think all of us in Parliament should try to embrace this, often debates on tax are seen as the interests of the economy on the one hand versus the interests of public services on the other. I think that is the wrong uh, way to look at it. Our taxes pay for the infrastructure that our economy needs. Uh, they pay for the additional support for entrepreneurs that I was announcing just yesterday. They pay for the small business bonus, which removes small businesses from the burden of business rates. So we need to look at this from the point of view of what kind of country do we want to be, what kind of economy do we want to have, and what kind of society do we uh, want. Uh, the final point I would make, uh, presiding officer, is this, and I uh, say it in the spirit of an open discussion, I hope the Conservatives would reflect on the fact uh, that their policy, which has been analysed in this paper, along with the policies uh, from our manifestos last year of all of the parties, the Conservative uh, proposal would reduce public spending in Scotland by £140 million. Pounds. Now, given that Ruth Davidson regularly asks me to increase public spending on a range of issues, I think that's something the Tories have to seriously reflect upon. Ruth Davidson. There was a reason, presiding officer, I asked specifically about the economic assessment that economists and trade bodies want, and that's because, uh, and it perhaps properly hasn't been understood, that under the New Deal agreed between the UK and Scottish governments, if Scotland's economy grows more quickly than the rest of the UK, the additional revenues will flow directly to Holyrood, whereas if Scotland grows more slowly, revenue will drop. So we all need to know if a tax rise will slow down growth in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. Now, job creators, retailers and industry figures have stated their belief that this will happen if taxes rise. So how does the First Minister answer their concerns? First well, their concerns will be answered in the round of the decisions we take. As I've said very clearly, those decisions uh, must have the interests of uh, public services, the lowest earners in our society and the economy at heart. And it's coming to balanced, responsible and progressive decisions that is the objective of this government. Of course, as Ruth Davidson is also aware, uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission now has the statutory responsibility uh, for providing the tax forecast that the Scottish budget will be based upon. And, you know, we have had the Office of the Chief Economist carry out the analysis in this paper, but the analysis that will guide our budget, of course, is that done by the Fiscal Commission, who will take into account a range of different factors. Uh, two final points to make on this. Firstly, um, in terms of uh, Ruth Davidson's point about tax generally, one of the points I made this morning, and I, I see a, a think tank reform Scotland making this same point, is that uh, it would be better for all of us if Scotland had a wider range of tax powers at our disposal. It is not an ideal position to be in, to simply have uh, income tax to look at, but that is the position we are in, and therefore we have to take balanced, progressive, uh, decisions on the basis of that. But finally, uh, the competitiveness and the attractiveness of our economy 
is not just about our tax rates, important though that is, it's also about the quality of our public services. It's about the skills of our population. It's about the infrastructure we have as a country. And right now, Scotland has the highest quality public service provision anywhere in the UK. We have the most generous social contract anywhere in the UK. And taking account of any of the potential options in the tax paper we've published today, Scotland will remain the most cost effective place to be in the UK. I think that's a great position to be in, but because of Brexit, because of austerity, policies imposed by Ruth Davidson's party, we have to ask ourselves how we protect all that matters to us as a country, and that's what will drive the decisions that this government takes. Ruth Davidson. Well, there is another principle that I'd hope the Scottish Government would follow uh, that they haven't mentioned so far, and that's simplicity, because the Fraser Vallander Institute has made clear that there is a strong argument for keeping the tax system as straightforward and transparent as possible. As they point out, the more complex it becomes, the more inefficient it is. Now, one of the proposals put forward this morning suggests as many as six tax bans. So will the First Minister take heed of warnings that a new, more complex tax system could create unintended consequences which detrimentally impact the amount of money raised? First Minister. Well, <laughs> there's an irony behind that question because I think it is commonly accepted that the UK right now has the most complex tax system anywhere in the world. And of course, uh, much of what lies behind that, even with income tax, remains out with the power and responsibility of this Parliament. But let me look at the proposals uh, that are, are in the paper for discussion to illustrate the options open to us. Some of them do propose uh, a, a greater number of tax bans. And, and one of the things that is commented on in the paper is that actually uh, by international standards, uh, that number, even the highest number in, in these options today, which would be six tax bans, would not be unusual in an international uh, context. And also, and this I think is a point made in the paper, often in tax systems, the more bans there are, the more progressive the tax system is overall, because it allows uh, tax to be more uh, acutely aligned to the ability to pay. Now, I know progressive tax and relating it to the ability to pay is not a principle particularly close to the hearts of the Conservatives, but it is a principle very close to the hearts of this government. But I come back to the central, the central point here, presiding officer. Uh, we have... Uh, good quality public services, uh, albeit they have challenges. We've got a good social contract. Uh, we've got good support for business and for infrastructure. But we face further austerity from the Tories. We face the impact of Brexit. We know we face an ageing population. So if we want to protect the society and the economy that we want to have, then these discussions are vital. Uh, and that's why the question uh, or the point I, I, I posed earlier on to Ruth Davidson is an important one. The Tories... Uh, proposal analysed in this paper is to give a tax cut to the top 10% of earners in the country, which would take £140 million out of the Scottish budget. Ruth Davidson and the Conservatives, uh, before they go any further in this tax debate, have to explain how they would pay for that and who would bear the burden of that. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, despite the attempted distortions, the reasons that we support, the reasons that we support a competitive tax regime is because we believe that will develop Scotland's economy, boosting the income tax that we need for our schools and hospitals. And we don't think it's right that every Scot earning more than £24,000 should have to pay more, because the bottom line here is about getting growth, and we are lagging behind. Scotland's economy is currently growing at a third of the rate of the United Kingdom. And when we look to the Scottish Government just this week, we discover a £500 million growth scheme announced a year ago, still to distribute a single penny. We see that it's failed to meet a pledge to set up a new strategic board to take forward its plans on enterprise and skills by the deadline which was set. Yep. And we've got a First Minister who wants to start a debate about raising taxes. But doesn't she see that first and foremost, we need to have a debate about boosting economic growth in Scotland to levels at least that of elsewhere in these islands? Yeah. <laughs> Well, First Minister. firstly, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not quite sure where Ruth Davidson has been in recent weeks, but Nora Senior, a very highly respected businesswoman in Scotland, has been appointed to chair the strategic board and is currently working hard uh, to put that uh, in place to make sure that we align the work of our enterprise and skills agencies. Can I also point out to Ruth Davidson, it may have passed her by, but actually one of the illustrative options in this paper would actually reduce tax 
for the very lowest income earners in Scotland, making the system even more progressive. But, you know, we come back to the central point. Um, I absolutely agree, and let's make this a point of consensus, that it is absolutely uh, of central importance to support the growth of our economy. But Ruth Davison's proposal would involve, in the budget that we will set in a matter of weeks' yeah. Time, if we were to take forward Ruth Davidson's proposal for a tax cut for the very richest and highest earners in our society, of finding £140 million to take out of our budget before we do anything else. Now, I say again to Ruth Davidson, that is an issue she has to answer in this debate. For the part of our government, uh, we will put forward our proposals to protect our public services, to protect our ability to invest in the economy and make sure we are doing everything we possibly can to protect the most vulnerable in our society. Those are our priorities and they will guide the development and the decisions in our budget. Jackie Bailey. Could I welcome the discussion paper on tax and the focus on progressive taxation. But can the First Minister tell the Chamber how much she needs to raise to end austerity? First Minister. You see, I would encourage Labour to take part in this discussion in the spirit that we are opening this discussion. The, the, the analysis sets out very openly how much each of the proposals of the parties at the election last year would raise, and it sets out how much would be raised by the alternative proposals we have put forward. That's a starting point for discussion. We have to balance a budget. We have to take account of different things. We have to mitigate austerity. Uh, I think we, as I've said before, we have to provide a fair pay increase for our public sector workers. So let's have that discussion and let us try to come to a consensus that is in the best interest of everybody across our country. Jackie Bailey. Um, let me help the First Minister with an answer because I think you need to know the scale of the challenge you face. So to end austerity, you need to raise more than £800 million in revenue over the next two years. That's before we consider additional commitments. Yet the government's proposals published today in the tax paper raises a maximum of £290 million. That doesn't even come close to closing the gap. There is a black hole. There's a black hole in the budget and more services will end up being cut. And on top of that, after months of Labour pressure, the First Minister has promised public sector workers a pay rise. And that is very welcome indeed. But public sector workers haven't had a pay rise since 2010, not a proper decent pay rise. So we need to be clear and we need a specific answer from the First Minister. Will she keep her promise and deliver a cost of living, real terms pay rise to public sector workers, and will it be fully funded by this Scottish Government? First Minister. Labour. Labour seems mired in confusion in this debate. I mean, Jackie Bailey puts a figure of £800 million before us today. Uh, Labour's proposals, or at least the, the latest Labour proposals, because there have been so many, don't come close to raising that. So unless Labour is saying that they're going to pile more pressure onto the lowest income taxpayers, then you know they've got questions to answer there. On public sector pay, I've been very clear, we will set out our public pay, uh, sector pay policy, the detail of that when we publish our budget, that's the normal uh, course of events. I want to see fair pay increases for our public sector workers. Of course, they've got to be affordable, which is one of the reasons this debate on tax is so important. We have set out here a range of possible options. There may be other options that parties want to bring forward, but let's go into this discussion in the spirit of trying to find consensus that is in the interests of our society, our public services, and our economy. That's what I would encourage all parties to do. And let, let's, at least those of us uh, on this side uh, of the chamber, let's not forget that yes, the impact of Tory austerity, uh, it goes further than anything this parliament can do to mitigate it. That's why we should keep up the pressure on the Conservatives and on the Chancellor as we go uh, forward to his budget to stop austerity, to end austerity at source, not have it passed on to the shoulders of the most vulnerable in our society. Jackie Bailey. Let me provide the First Minister with some detail. And can I refer to page 32 of her own document, where Labour's proposals are costed at around £700 million in one year, 
I talked about £800 million in two years. I think even she will agree that there is more than enough in Labour's proposals to end austerity, something she has so far refused to do. But, presiding officer, you know, with this government, promises are made to be broken. Her promise to parents and teachers to cut class sizes, broken. Her promise to our young people to abolish student debt, broken. Her promise to our elderly to eradicate delayed discharge in our hospitals, broken. Now she also has a promise that she made to patients of a legal guarantee to treatment within 12 weeks, also broken. Now we have before us, presiding officer, a tax plan that simply doesn't add up and a list of commitments she knows she can't pay for. So tell me, First Minister, who are you going to fail next? First Minister. On the basis of that performance, no wonder Labour are going through leaders or people at the dispatch box at the rate that they are. Maybe one of these days they'll find one capable of asking a decent question. But let's get back to this. I, in all seriousness, Jackie Bailey, James Kelly is shouting at me, what's the answer? What was the question? She asked me. I mean, if anybody can work that out, they're doing a lot better than me. But I think Labour have just demonstrated that it is incapable of the kind of mature, serious and honest debate that this document actually opens the door to. And you know what? Jackie Bailey, I'm not sure if Jackie Bailey did this deliberately or whether she just doesn't understand the figures in this paper. But you know, when she was quoting, when she was quoting figures about the Labour policy, she deliberately excluded the behaviour change element. But when she quoted the figures about when she quoted the figures about the SNP policy, she included that. So you can do it one way or the other, but you've got to be consistent. So let's get back to the central point at issue here. We have opened the door today to a serious, mature, grown-up discussion about how we fund our public services and our economy. Let's see if any of the other parties in this chamber are capable of such maturity. Okay. Would members please, would members please, please be a little bit more quiet. Listen to the question and then listen to the answer respectfully. We'll, I live in hope. We'll take some constituency questions now. The first from uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of proposals by the City of Edinburgh Council to close one of Scotland's national centres of excellence, the City of Edinburgh Music School. I declare a personal interest as my daughter is an alumna of the school. Can the First Minister confirm that funding for Scotland's national centres of excellence across the country continue to be provided by the Scottish Government? Does she agree that the City of Edinburgh Council does not have unfettered discretion to close the school? And importantly, will she consider how in the near future the financial arrangements in place to support all of Scotland's national centres of excellence can be restated and made clear to ensure that staff, parents, pupils and future pupils have clarity and certainty about the future of these world-class facilities? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, I agree that these are world-class facilities. Um, in answer to the specific part of Andy Whiteman's question, yes, there is uh, specific funding for the school, although that is now rolled up within uh, the total local government settlement. Uh, we highly value uh, the role of all six centres of excellence in Scotland, including the City of Edinburgh Music School. Uh, the Scottish Government has been engaging with the City of Edinburgh Council on this matter. Uh, of course, it's only a proposal that the Council is considering at this stage in its budget consultation. But I do think uh, the Council will want to reflect the fact that uh, these centres of excellence, including uh, the music school, allow children and young people across Scotland the opportunity to receive expert tuition in their specialism, in this case, music. That's something uh, very valuable, and I, I think there's plenty of evidence of that, and I'm sure the importance of that is something that the City of Edinburgh Council is reflecting on carefully. Morris Golden. Molly is 18 months old. She suffers from reflux and won't eat solid food. Facing a 12-week wait to see a specialist, Molly's parents were extremely concerned about the physical and psychological impact of this condition. Mo Molly was then told by Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS that her wait had increased to 21 weeks, 
the development and well-being of a baby is on the line. Will the First Minister agree to meet Molly's parents and urgently look into this case? First Minister. Well, firstly, I, uh, based on what I've, I've heard there from the member, I absolutely understand the anxiety of, of Molly's parents. Uh, this is a, a situation that will be of huge concern to them. The, the well-being and development of all babies is, is of absolutely paramount importance. I will certainly urgently look into this case and uh, make, uh, avail myself of, of the detail of this and uh, I will ask the Health Secretary to write to the member and if, if necessary certainly engage with the parents uh, of Molly and I'm sure we all want to wish uh, them and Molly uh, the very best. And Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, technical issues and staffing problems are severely disrupting the Gourock to Kilcraig and Ferry service. The service is regularly off for weeks on end and it is again suspended this week. The current situation is untenable and unacceptable. The Transport Minister has promised to get a grip of the situation, but local patience is running extremely thin. What assurance can the First Minister provide today that a solution is in sight and that users of the Kilcreggan Ferry will finally get the service that they deserve? First Minister. Well, it's hugely important that uh, people who rely on our ferry services have uh, reliable uh, services uh, to use. Uh, that's the case in this route as it is with, with all of the routes. We invest heavily in our ferry services. Uh, there are many new routes uh, available uh, now. Uh, on the specific of Gourock to Craig and, and the issues that the member is raising, uh, I will speak uh, directly to the Transport Minister and uh, ask him to reply uh, to the member. It is vital if there are issues that are being experienced there, everything possible is done to rectify and resolve them. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I also welcome the very interesting discussion paper on income tax from the government today? Last year in the election, between all of the political parties, three basic ideas were put forward on tax. One, no change, whether without a little tweaking on the thresholds that would have benefited only the wealthiest. Or an increase on the basic rate, which would have increased tax for low earners. And finally, the Green proposition, which showed that we can raise revenue for our public services while protecting low earners and reducing inequalities with a fairer range of rates and bans. Isn't it clear now that the no change option that the SNP put forward is off the table and an increase in the basic rate is off the table and the green option of a fairer range of rates and bans is the only serious option left standing? First Minister. Well, t t 10 out of 10 for effort in uh, claiming credit for everything in, in the paper. Um, let me just say, in point of fact, the, the SNP's proposal from our manifesto last year was not no change, and that is borne out in the paper in terms of the revenue uh, forecasts uh, for that. Uh, Patrick Harvey is right, though, to say that uh, we were uh, not in agreement with proposals that would increase tax for the lowest earners, and I still do not favour proposals that increase tax for the lowest earners, but I do uh, recognise, I recognise in the programme for government that given the pressures we face and given our desire and determination to protect what really matters to people across Scotland, then we must have an open and honest discussion about whether those on the highest incomes uh, pay a modest amount more to try to enable us to protect services. So we look forward uh, to engaging in these discussions. Uh, I hope all parties will do so constructively. The other point, and to be fair to Patrick Harvey, this is a point he has made previously. Uh, and you know, I'm frequently told in this chamber we are a minority administration. If all parties simply stick to their manifesto positions, we will not pass a budget. And if this parliament doesn't pass a budget, this parliament fails in its duty to the Scottish people. So we have an opportunity now uh, not to stick doggedly yeah. to previous positions, but come into a discussion with the best interests of the country at heart. And if we all do that, we'll get a budget passed, but more importantly, we'll get the right budget passed. Yeah. Patrick Harvey. My, uh, my first question wasn't meant as a criticism. I congratulate the First Minister for seeing the sense in what the Greens have been advocating for the last couple of years. Uh, it's, it's very clear, it's very clear that the only way the Scottish Government can pass a budget this year is by raising enough revenue for public priorities like an inflation-based increase in public sector pay, but to do it fairly in a way that reduces inequality. If we do that, 
Isn't it also clear that there must then be an equally open and creative discussion about the other side of the tax picture, the local tax picture, where the SNP has stalled on local tax reform for far too long, something which is overdue and a project which must be put back onto the agenda? First Minister. Well, you know, firstly, we made reforms uh, last year to the system of local taxation. Those reforms are right now providing additional revenue that are helping to support public services right across the country. Um, I know Patrick Harvey's position on uh, wider reform to, to local tax, and no doubt that is a discussion we will all continue to have in the years to come. But this Parliament has got a job ahead of it over the next few weeks, and that is to come to a position on tax and to pass a budget that protects our public services and protects investment in our economy. The document we've published today, I think, gives us a really good foundation to try to do that. Um, and this will be a test not just of the government's ability to be open and honest and realistic and mature in our approach to this. It will be a test of every party in this parliament as well. So let's see if we can live up to that test, all of us collectively. Uh, the next few weeks will answer that question for us. Yeah. And some more supplementaries. The first from Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Papers released this week from the Joint Programme Board overseeing the British Transport Police merger show that there is still work required to assess the cost of the merger. Does the First Minister agree that progressing the merger of BTP and Police Scotland without doing a full cost analysis in the first instance demonstrates a shocking lack of financial prudence on the part of the Scottish Government? And further, what comments does the First Minister have on the petition handed in this week with over 11,500 signatures against the merger? First Minister. Well, no, I, I don't agree with Mary Fee. The merger of the British Transport Police, which has now been devolved to the Scottish Government, something that Labour supported in the context of the Smith Commission, it's been taken forward for three main reasons, to approve, improve accountability, to make sure the transport police have access to the wider range of resources of Police Scotland, but also to future-proof the governance of the British Transport Police, because we know the Conservative UK manifesto at the last election said that they were going to create a bigger infrastructure police force and absorb the British Transport Police within that. So if we don't take actions here, we risk leaving uh, the British Transport Poli Police isolated within uh, that governance structure. So we will take forward uh, these proposals uh, sensibly and responsibly. The, the Joint Programme Board is there precisely uh, to do the detailed work to make sure that this is a success. And we will continue, of course, to work uh, with those uh, who are employed in the British Transport Police to make sure we're taking account of all of their concerns as we go forward. Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 50 years ago today, the people of Hamilton and Blantyre elected Winnie Ewing. The 2nd of November 1967 was in many ways the start of modern Scottish politics in which this nation aspires to being an outward-looking, gender-balanced European nation. Does the First Minister agree now, as in 1967, the message should ring out, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on? Briefly, yeah. First Minister. Of course, it, it was in this day in 1967 that Winnie Ewing won the Hamilton by-election. Uh, I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that that by-election changed the course of Scottish political history. <laughs> Winnie Ewing has been a trailblazer in so many ways. Uh, as a champion of Scottish independence, as a woman in a man's yeah, world, absolutely. and in this parliament when she famously reconvened it in 1999. Winnie Ewing is quite simply a legend in her own lifetime. So Winnie, if you're watching, we send you our love and we thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This week, the UK Government published the report of the independent inquiry chaired by Dame Elish Angelini into deaths in custody, along with their response. I have previously called for an inquiry into deaths in custody in Scotland because I strongly believe there could be improvements both in the interest of families and the police, particularly following the death of Sheku Bayou while in police custody in Fife. Will the First Minister today commit to holding an inquiry 
And can I also ask for her response to Dame Angelini's report and the relevance of its recommendations for Scotland? First Minister. Well, of course, we will carefully consider uh, Dame Ailish Angelini's uh, report. Uh, the government will do that. I'm sure the Crown Office uh, will do that as well. I think it is important to uh, remind members that custody arrangements in Scotland are distinct from those in England and Wales under the Fatal Accidents uh, and Sudden Death Scotland Act 2016. An FEI uh, fatal accident inquiry must be held into any death in police custody unless the Lord Advocate is satisfied that the circumstances have already been clearly established in other proceedings. But we do recognise that there are improvements that could be made, so we will study this report uh, carefully and determine whether there are any actions that either the Scottish Government or, or this is for the Crown Office, they will decide whether there are any actions uh, they require to take. Um, while understanding uh, the concern uh, that members have into the circumstances surrounding the death of Sheikha Bayo, uh, th the member will appreciate that I'm not able to comment uh, more directly on that right now because that's still under uh, consideration by the Crown Office. But these are important issues at uh, which the government will pay serious attention to. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister. In light of reports that McMillan Cancer Support is acting to combat so-called fake news regarding health conditions, what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that people are not misled by fake medical information online? First Minister. Well, this is a, an important question. I think Macmillan's appointment of a, a digital nurse is really welcome and will be a very useful resource for patients. Accessible, robust and uh, accurate medical information is vital, which is why NHS 24 produces the website nhsinform.scot. NHS Inform follows strict ongoing clinical quality assurance processes in partnership with a range of organisations, including Macmillan Cancer Support, to verify the accuracy and quality of content. And I would uh, urge anybody who wants to go online uh, to look into any medical condition to use nhsinform.scot because they can be assured that they get reliable and accurate information there. Stuart Macmillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply and as the services on NHS inform such as the information on treatments and tests and guided to finding the right local services can be of use to many people across Scotland. Can the First Minister outline what steps have actually have been taken to promote the website for better use in Scotland? First Minister. Well, NHS Inform does provide a range of information, not just on uh, procedures, but also advice on healthy living, on different illnesses and conditions, and on health rights, uh, amongst other subjects. In April of this year, NHS 24 launched a publicity campaign, including social media activity and advertisements on buses and trains that has significantly raised public awareness of NHS Inform. And the number of visits to it has almost quadrupled since the launch of that campaign from 116,000 visits in April 2017 to 463,000 in September. So the NHS will continue to take steps to make people aware of that. And as MSPs, all of us have a role to play in making sure our constituents are aware of it too. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Macmillan Cancer Support also are rightly concerned about cancer waiting times. They point to the fact that NHS Lanarkshire seem, in fact, to be the only health board achieving target in this area. This is due in part to the fact that Lanarkshire published not only uh, details of their delays, but the reasons for those delays and steps that they are taking to mitigate. Does the First Minister agree that it is now time to roll this practice out across all of our health boards so we can reduce uh, cancer waiting times in the same way that Lanarkshire has done? It's a little bit wide, but First Minister. Well, uh, of course, the, the Health Secretary is already chairing uh, a group to look at uh, what more needs to be done uh, to further reduce uh, cancer waiting times. And one of the key objectives of that group is to look at the learning from NHS Lanarkshire, which uh, is to be applauded for the work it has done, uh, to see how that can better be rolled out across the rest of Scotland. So I'll ask the Health Secretary to keep the member up to date as that work progresses. Question number five, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what criteria will be used to assess the outcomes of pupil equity funding. First Minister. Uh, nationally, we are currently consulting on the criteria that will be used to measure progress towards closing the attainment gap, and we will confirm our approach within the 2018 National Improvement Plan, which will be published in December. Uh, locally, we expect schools and authorities to make use of data they already have and to incorporate details of their pupil equity funding into existing planning and reporting processes, including in their annual school improvement plans and standards and quality reports. School inspection and other review processes will also be used where necessary to ensure that schools are using their funding appropriately. Elizabeth. 
Uh, the First Minister will be aware of the recent reports which indicate that the Pupil Equity Fund is being used in some councils to plug gaps in other areas of local education budgets, for example, on janitors' overtime. Does the First Minister agree that some of these decisions do not have the necessary focus on literacy and numeracy in the way that the Scottish Government has stated? And in order to help restore this focus, will the First Minister agree to reverse the Scottish Government's decision to remove Scotland from well-respected international measurements on literacy and numeracy? First Minister. Well, given, given the, the discussion that we regularly have in this Parliament about uh, PISA uh, results, I, I think there is a fair amount of international scrutiny on the performance of Scottish, uh, the Scottish education system. Of course, uh, part of the purpose of the National Improvement Framework work is to make sure we have much more rigorous and detailed information here in Scotland on the performance of our schools and the education system more generally. On the issue of PEF funding, uh, PEF funding is there to provide additionality in our schools, particularly targeted at closing the attainment gap. Liz Smith will be aware that claims, for example, that Glasgow City Council uh, plan to use PEF money to part fund the settlement uh, of the janitor's pay dispute are quite simply wrong, you know, factually inaccurate. Uh, that settlement is funded without a single penny of PEF uh, money being used. Uh, so, uh, Obviously, it's for head teachers to determine how they think it best to use that money, but the money should be for new services in line with the criteria for PEF uh, and services that are about improving standards <coughs> in our school and closing the attainment gap. And uh, the work that I spoke about in my initial answer uh, will help us to monitor that as the Pupil Equity Fund scheme continues. Ian Gray. The Pupil, Pupil Equity Fund is uh, indeed a good thing but it must indeed be uh, additional. It is just common sense that there will be pressure on the fund to plug gaps in core funding uh, as long as core council and school budgets are being cut year on year uh, alongside PEF being made available. So will the First Minister promise to end those cuts to councils and to schools in the budget so that the equity fund can indeed do the job that it is designed to do? First Minister. Well, a few quick points to that. I'm glad to hear Ian Gray say that the Pupil Equity Fund is a good thing. He might want to try and explain why Labour voted against it in the budget yeah. if he thinks it is such yeah. a well, good thing. Yeah. Uh, you secondly... Well, you did. Secondly... It's an answer. Order, please. It's, ama it's amazing how Labour really don't like having some basic facts pointed out to them. They get very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> but back to the serious issue at hand. Secondly, local budgets, the spending power of local yeah. councils, as we heard the Finance Secretary talk about just before First Minister's questions, increased uh, in this financial year. Yeah. Uh, how we continue to protect local services is part of the discussion we've opened today around tax. Uh, but the third and final point I would make is this. Uh, local councils uh, also had the opportunity to increase their council tax up to 3% in this financial year. And strangely, the only councils across Scotland who didn't use that power were Labour councils. So, you know, they come here asking for more money from the Scottish Government, where their own councils won't exercise the powers they have to increase funding available. Question number six, Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government plans to take to help families faced with financial hardship should interest rates rise. First Minister. Well, in November 2014, we launched Scotland's Financial Health Service. Uh, this is a one-stop uh, web-based service which provides impartial information for anyone with a concern about debt, borrowing, managing money or general financial concerns. The service can signpost anyone to the most appropriate area of support and they can find the help they need in one place. In addition, we're committed to establishing a financial health check guarantee that provides advice on how people can maximise their income and access the best deals on utility and financial products. And we also support families in need through the Scottish Welfare Fund. Polly McNeill. 10 years of wage stagnation, low wages and the rising cost of living means that more households could be tipped over the edge into serious financial difficulty. Should there even be a small rise in interest rates later on today? I wonder if the First Minister shares my concern. But there are one third of Scots who are worried about the amount of money that they owe. And there are many turning to credit for essential things. And that includes things like their gas and their electricity and basic things. Indeed, the OBR, and this is a very serious point, presiding officer, said that household debt in four years' time 
could be as high as 47 per cent. So I realise it's difficult to respond to, to, to the magnitude of that question. But I wonder, in view of the First Minister's answer and the importance of affordable credit, is it time for the government to invest more seriously in affordable credit and promote credit unions more seriously so they have a crucial role to play in increasing financial inclusion? Yeah. One area I think is worth looking at... A question, at. Ms McNeill, please. A question, please. <clears throat> I'm really genuinely surprised at the reaction to, to, to the question now. Ask a question, please, McMillan. As the First Minister, if she would look at profit, non -for not profit, profit lending schemes such as Conduit Scotland and Fife, because there is a very significant and serious role that credit unions and schemes like this can play. For let's not forget the many question, Scots please, who Neil. will face financial hardship. Would she be prepared to take a personal interest in taking this forward? Thank you. First Minister. Well, firstly, on, on the, the point of consensus here, because there is a, a big area of consensus, I, I agree with the thrust of, of Polly McNeill's question. I'm a, a massive supporter of the credit union movement. I think it does fantastic work. This government has uh, supported the credit union movement and will continue to do so, and we'll look at what more we can do uh, for that. Um, I understand uh, the Bank of England has just announced uh, the first rise in interest rates since, I think, July 2007, a 0.25% increase. And I know that will be of concern to uh, families uh, across the country. We will continue to look at how we support those on the lowest incomes. Um, and going back to one of the central issues we've been discussing at First Minister's questions today, this is genuinely uh, one of the points of disagreement between uh, those of us in these benches and Labour about our approach to income tax. We don't think we should increase income tax on the lawest income families for many of the reasons uh, Pauline McNeill has been talking about. So these uh, issues have to be at the heart of all of the decisions we take and they will continue to be so from the perspective of this government. Yeah. Question number seven, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister how many households have received support from the Scottish Welfare Fund? First Minister. Since the creation of the Scottish Welfare Fund in April 2013, over uh, 265,000 households in Scotland have received grants totalling £140 million. Uh, one third of those households were families with children. Of course, it's not acceptable that this type of support covering the basic cost of living, such as food and heating, is needed by so many people. But we know that the impact of the UK government's harsh welfare cuts uh, is having uh, on people. And we've repeatedly warned that the chaotic rollout of universal credit, particularly the six-week delay for first payment, is pushing more households into crisis. We will continue to do all we can to support hard-pressed families and remain absolutely committed to a welfare system that treats people with respect and dignity. George Adam. Thank the First Minister for her answer. Is the First Minister aware that reports this week warned that disabled people and their families are being left hungry, cold and homeless by Tory welfare cuts, with some being driven to thoughts of suicide? Given that 30,000 people in Scotland could lose out once the UK Government's PIP rollout is complete, does the First Minister foresee demand for Scottish welfare fund growing further as the Tory obsession with austerity continues? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Yes, I do. Um, I was very concerned, like uh, many uh, will have been very concerned at the findings of the report, which also highlighted that 44 per cent of disabled people could see their disability benefits reduced or completely removed. And that is just an example of the continued onslaught of welfare cuts from the Tory government hitting the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, it's putting immense financial and uh, at times emotional pressure on them. Uh, when there's still a lot of month left at the end of the money, people need to have somewhere to turn. And so while I wish it wasn't necessary, that's why I'm glad that we do provide a safety net through the Scottish Welfare Fund. However, people need more than just that. They need the UK government to pay attention to the catalogue of evidence of damage that they are causing to the most vulnerable and to act now to reverse these cuts. Yes, yes. That's Concludes First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business in the name of Annie Wells. I would just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.